Once again, here I am in the depths of winter, feeling somewhat demoralised, and I've had to drag myself kicking and screaming into posting another inconsequential and almost certainly utterly ineffective video as my sole opportunity of expressing my resistance to the coming totalitarianism. I'm broke, in debt, with no work in the pipeline and with little prospect of that changing anytime soon. In that respect, I feel I'm pretty much in tune with the state of Western civilization in general. But unlike Western civilization, I have been here before, seeming at the end of my rope, at the end of the road. And although I have been as hopeless, I've managed to muddle through somehow. Much of my situation is my own propensity to pessimism, a lack of self-belief, along with some very real consequences of poor life decisions. And although I don't consider myself to have ever achieved anything that could remotely be described as success, compared to, say, the United States, to take a ridiculous example, once the most powerful entity in history, which is currently in debt to the tune of $34 trillion, and with equally very little prospect of ever paying it back, I probably shouldn't be too hard on myself. And it's at times like this that one has to look hard and scratch around for any possible reasons to carry on. And this is not easy. Churchill famously said, when you're going through hell, keep going. And this is probably good advice, which is apt if you have, for instance, a business or a service that is in some demand, but you are struggling to make it profitable. If you keep pounding at it, with luck and a following wind, it should come good. The problem, as I see it, is when you are no longer in demand, your services are either no longer required, or the competition has become so great that one is reduced to a race to the bottom, where you must reduce your own value in order to scavenge at least some scraps from the table. And at 56, it's probably the very worst time to have to experience such feelings. At 56, I have entered the second to last cat age category that one fills in on official forms, 56 to 65. Over 65 is the only one that's left. There was a period in my life that I was ahead of the game, but at 56 it is beyond any pretense that I'll ever have anything original to say now. At 56 it's the very worst time to realise this, apart from at 57 I suppose. It's depressing, it's demoralising, and it's humiliating. But then it's no worse than many millions have faced in past times, are facing now, or will face in the future. So why do we carry on? Mostly because we have no alternative. Giving up is no option, unless we really give up on everything. If you get my drift. As Bruce Springsteen, as eloquent as Shakespeare at times, put it, what you don't surrender, well the world just strips away. But whilst there are always reasons for giving up, there are always more and better reasons to carry on. One of which is that things may change, and they may even change for the better, no matter how unlikely that may seem in the moment. Another reason, and this is pertinent for the entire raison d'etre of this channel and the wider movement, they want us to feel this way. They want us to give up hope and to lose hope. You can tell this by their actions, if not their words. And sometimes, such as the case of the Medical Assistance in Dying or MAID initiative in Canada, it is a matter of policy they will actively help you to give up. So even if you cannot sum up any other reason to carry on, that one should suffice. They may hate us, they may wish us gone, they may want us to become dependent on them if we must, even though they would most ardently like us to just disappear 
bequeath any wealth or assets to them and for us to never bother them again. The Canadian government is only the first to openly help their citizens kill themselves. As Canada was one of the freest countries in the world, it was important that it was achieved there first. Like the freezing of bank accounts, it will come to the rest of us soon enough. But of course these are negative reasons. They're valid, but they're negative. And whilst this whole notion of positivity is not one that comes naturally to me, I do of course have an overwhelmingly positive reason for not surrendering. Mrs X. This is obvious and requires no further explanation. But for me there is another. Just over 18 months ago I was blessed, and I do mean blessed, with the arrival of my granddaughter. That's her in the thumbnail. Sadly for you, and for obvious reasons, I've had to disguise her beautiful face. But you can still clearly see the grinning idiot in whose arm she's in. And that grinning idiocy is no lie. I was giddy by her arrival, and remain so. And more so, with every passing day. Now I like to be somewhat vague about my personal life. And I don't want to get over emotional. But this is relevant, because who has grandchildren? People in their 50s, 60s and 70s. People like me. And judging by the analytics that YouTube compiles, they're also people like you. Mostly people, and mostly men it must be said, in middle age. You are my audience. And why is that? Why is it that my thoughts chime in with yours? It's because we remember. We remember what this country used to be like, how it used to work, whilst it's never been perfect. We remember how it basically functioned, how it was basically fair, and how it was basically good. And we know what it has been replaced with, and we're old enough to remember how it was, how it compares, how it compares now, and crucially, we can see where it's heading. We are the demographic that can see what's going on. Not because we are cleverer than those younger than us, but because we can compare. And that makes us angry. Of course, as has been pointed out to me by a younger bloke, it wasn't the younger generation that is allowed to allow things to get so bad. And if you're anything like me, that makes us angrier. I've been trying to alert people for some time but even I was late to the party. I should have started earlier, and I should have adhered to some basic principles. I should have made more of a nuisance of myself to others when I witnessed them selling themselves, their children and their principles down the river for a little temporary comfort. But it's tempting to surrender to those feelings of decrepitude which may or may not be real, depending on your level of fitness, enthusiasm, or even, frankly, money. But grandchildren arrive with a message, and it's one we mostly, but implicitly, if not acknowledge. We don't often articulate it, but we absorb it nonetheless. So what is this message? The message is, quite simply, you're not done yet, mate. You're not finished. Don't think about putting your feet up. There is work to be done. You have help to give. You have things to teach. You have a perspective to offer. Despite what our youth obsessed society says, you are needed. You are required to show up. Perhaps only as support, but to show up nonetheless. This is more obvious to grandmothers, I suppose as they guide the new mothers, and their experience is all the more necessary to counteract the contemporary psychobabble. The latest trans lunacy folds like paper in the face of the solid common sense of the average grandmother. It is self-evident. For us grandads, it's not so explicit, but it's there. We're only pushed out relative to grandmothers, 
in the same way as we were pushed out as fathers, if you can call it that, by the mothers. That was the way of things then, as it is now. Now, I appreciate that this has not been my most positive of my posts. As you know, positivity is not my forte. But even my pessimism has limits. It's like being backed into a corner. It's only by being backed into a corner, perhaps with nothing to lose, that many of us can find the strength to come out fighting. Good King Harry said, the fewer men, the greater share of glory on the eve of battle. But it's likely also to be true that the worse the odds, the sweeter the glory. Who can deny the glory of coming out swinging and guns blazing? And how sweet would it be if the turnkey totalitarians were defeated by a load of has-beens and perhaps even never was? At the risk of further ridicule, I would like to reiterate my call to arms for a group, a posse, even a militia of men. This will be my third time of asking, and although I understand that many are still not ready to take a stand that comes with some risk, I feel that that time is coming. The tone of the conversation has changed since the business in Israel and Gaza, and I'm not interested in whatever side you come down on. There are a lot more people who understand that we are now in danger. I have been embarrassed by others who have banged the drum for years when it cost them their reputations and offered much more. Most of these people have come to prominence during the Covid catastrophe, but there were many others before them, not least David Icke, Alex Jones and Tommy Robinson. These are men that have demonstrated that rarest of virtues, moral courage. In Robinson's case, he has been prepared to be despised by everyone. Everyone except white, male, working class men. And quite a few of them have despised, it, despised him too, believing that they were tainted by the public caricature of him. But he kept at it, despite the dangers to him and to his family. And over time, he has persuaded many others. So it would be lazy and cowardly of me to refrain from asking again despite scant, scant response. So well, I, I will keep asking. We need to build something, something that protects us and others like us. Everything good that America has to offer eventually comes our way, but so does everything bad. In the past week or so, I've seen videos of people obviously and brazenly stealing from shops in the UK in exactly the same way as they steal from shops in California, despite there not even being the fig leaf of shoplifting having been, de been decriminalised, as in California. These people do not fear the police, so why should we? The police don't police them. Why do they think they will police us? So what will you do when the bailiffs come to evict you? to repossess your car or your van? And what will you do when the police come to take your car because the tax rates have gone from £250 a year to £1,500 per year? Or when you cannot longer get an insurance and therefore cannot tax your car? What will you do then when you are stopped at night for having an untaxed, uninsured car that was taxed and insured the previous year and the only thing that has changed are the regulations? What will you do when paper mile comes in that makes it financially impossible for you to even drive to work and so you don't pay the fines? What will you do then? Argue with the police at the side of the road or the scumbag bailiffs on your own? Or will you argue with them when there are a hundred comrades that have appeared from nowhere back backing you up? The only way out of this is for us to come together and protect each other. Our society is dis disintegrating before our very eyes. The police will not protect us from obvious threats, but they absolutely will target each and every one of us when we are isolated and alone. The Hamas mobs have proved that. The police are petty bully boys when they outnumber their victims 
and utter cowards when presented with any resistance. And they bully us because they think we are weak. They don't think the Hamas mobs are weak. They police us because we respect the law. And they don't police them because they don't. In a perverse truth, the British police really do police with consent. If you consent to be arrested, they will arrest you. If you don't consent, well, they won't. The rule of law does not exist any longer in the United Kingdom. Only a fool believes otherwise. So come on you gammons. Come on you ageing, balding blokes with bad backs, beer bellies and hair coming out of your ears. Let them try to evict you or, or cut off your gas or tell you a wood burner is illegal if they can't get in the house. Talk to those others that are, are of a like mind and even those who, who you are unsure about. We do not have the luxury of trying to avoid ridicule. Are we to sell our grandchildren into technocratic slavery or Sharia rape because we are afraid of being labelled a conspiracy theorist or a racist? We should welcome those labels and wear them as badges of honour, as I found with refusing to wear a face nappy during the Covid insanity. Once you make the decision, you are liberated from the fear. Nobody is coming to save us. We have to save ourselves. This is the way. As far as I can tell, it's the only way. So come on, granddads. This country hasn't finished with you. I mean, what else are you going to do? Just run down the clock to a meaningless old age? Into nothingness? There is still work to be done. And what's more, even at our age, there's also glory to be had. We have a country to save for our grandkids.